With 77 speakers presenting over the three-day conference, it is not possible to include all the presentations on this DVD. This chapter includes some of the highlights from the non-plenary sessions of the conference. It's extremely important that cities govern themselves. I say this in this backdrop because one is attempting here when the Maharashtra government wanted hill station built. We hadn't built one since the British left. We came forth to said we will do that. An area was demarcated around the beautiful Varas Gaure created for irrigation. And we began the concept of building a new city. Now this city is built on the principles of new urbanism, which is really not needed in India, where we do have dense cities anyways. But the idea is that 80% of the people will live in 20% of the livable area. So you create a walking city, a safe city. And so you don't have excessive commute from outside into the place. Second is that it is based also on the principle of a transact model, where it's dense in the middle and it becomes sparse as you go out, rather than having suburbs where the middle classes live and, and the city where the rich lives. So that they are constantly a huge mass of people have to migrate in and out. Second is, the next important thing about a big city is not, it, it must be across socio-economic spectrum, including people that will come and have rental homes. And so in this new place, we took on this challenge of building Lavasa. We have based it on the transact model, on the principles of new urbanism. And the second most important thing now is that it has to be green. And what does green mean? Green means that it has to be sustainable. And for it to be sustainable, it must preserve, restore and enhance the ecology of the place in which it is set. And this is what we planned. What we inherited there was a land, denuded land. Most of the forests there were cut down for providing wood coal to Pune city. The pictures of barren land around there. We have to plant three million trees and hydro seed every slope in that seven hills so that it will stop the soil erosion that takes place today. It is one of the highest rainfalls after Chirapunji in the country is in that area. And that denudes the land because it's bare now and 60% of that water runs off along with the topsoil, further making the land barren. So we have to create that soil conserving um, plantation of hydro seeding the slopes, and creating contour trenches so that the topsoil doesn't burn off and the trees take root and you will get therefore reduce the runoff to just 20% which is what everywhere it should be and thereby greening the entire place, and therefore its water requirement comes down. And even in the month of May, where this has been done in Lavasa, you will find complete green trees. Then after they take root, they don't need water. The three months in the year is important, because that's how those trees are. In India, you get, you get water only three months in a year. Therefore, we are also engaged biomimicry, the new science of adapting to nature created by Janine Benyus, the third recipient after Al Gore and Gorbachev of the Friends of the Planet Award by the United Nations. The idea is to adapt to nature. And that is the moist deciduous forest in the Sayadri. And this is the kind of trees, once they take root, they need water only for that period and then they get through and then they survive throughout the year. And they keep the groundwater levels up, therefore it continues to exist. And these are the principles that we are following. Because the tree in London is also green, but it gets rain throughout the year. So it has a very different way of adapting. Each place has a genius of its own, and you have to adapt to that. Ant hills around the world are the same, where the ants live, at the same temperature. But when you see the ant hill, and its gradients, and its thickness, and the, and the, and the, 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 the surface of the walls of that, you'll find they're completely different. 
The ants have been able to figure out how to live. And so if we can mimic that, even in the architecture of the city, for example, in trees, you need, for a heavy downpour like this, you need a three-tire canopy of trees, the tall, the medium, and the, all clustered together so that the water doesn't hit the ground hard. Can we mimic architecture so there are three levels of roofs so that the same thing happens? So there are a variety of ways we can do this. Now when you come to Bombay, it'll have to be completely different. It's got to be high-rise. To create low-cost housing, there's got to be high-rise because there's no way the cost of land is so expensive unless you create at least even 10 or 15 or 50 FSI, you will not be able to get rental housing that's cheap enough. And it again has to be redone in clusters like neighborhoods are, like new cities are. So these are some of the features that Let Lavasa is going to follow. Then it comes to the question also of, of governance. When it comes to governance, how are we going to deal with it? We already have been appointed as a special planning authority, the first private sector company to get that status. Why? If we had gone by the method today prescribed to take the collector's permission for every building, it would have taken us 10,000 years to just get the permissions. There's no way it can be done unless the authority is decentralized. And if we could break three fundamental laws then we could bring this figure of 10,000 down to 200 years. But if you have to preserve the laws and do it, this will have to be delegated to a local authority, which was got created. We are now discussing a public-private partnership with the police, because there are some sovereign things only the police should do, but the rest can be outsourced, can be done. Parking, supervision, traffic management, the hardware for the police that is required. There's a whole host of things. This is under discussion. And we are looking at how do we now create a public-private partnership in the municipal governance where the citizens that live in Lavasa have a right to decide what they want and how much of it should be privatized so that the services continue to be, to be good in the city. This is something that will have to be evolved. And the organizers of this conference and the several experts that will speak here will help us develop that. So the idea is that if you have to create new cities and create them that fast, if you have to create new neighborhoods and create them that fast, improve the existing city from clusters and do that fast, we'll have to enter into public-private partnerships so that it can happen faster and delivery will come. I would try to take you along the path a little further to see whether we are prepared to accept the community, the occupants of any brownfield project to be our partners. The issue which in fact I'm going to highlight in today's presentation is the lack of a representative voice of the urban poor communities, certain things which was hinted upon by Abis as to when we plan when we take up a brownfield project, do we take into account the people who are residing there also can have a say and also can make a difference in the way we plan and when we take it forward. This background leads us to the present context in which we are, which I sort of term as a jigsaw puzzle of three A's. Affordability, availability, and acceptability. If I just run you through how these three A's are just not willing to come together, leading us to this sort of an elusive jigsaw puzzle being completed, is that we have affordable and available housing stock, what I call as the slum housing, which are affordable, therefore the poor have been able to find the solution of the housing in those settlements. They are available in plenty, depending on the pocket that, uh, the, the money that you have in your pocket. If you want to go in the distant suburb, you'll be able to afford a slum which is cheaper. If you want to get it in the inner city area, it will be costlier. But it is not acceptable to us. It has led us to all cities as divided cities which does not believe in inclusiveness, which talks about a city being a legal city and an illegal city. We have the second scenario 
where we have available and acceptable housing stock. It is said that in Mumbai, close to 100,000 flats would be available and acceptable because the building promotion de per per permission department of the municipal corporation would have approved that building stock, but are not affordable. So they lie under lock and key, but people cannot afford them. And the third scenario, we have acceptable and affordable housing stock so little that they are just not available. So this is the scenario where the two A's are coming together, but we are trying to struggle to see whether we can bring all the three A's together to complete the jigsaw puzzle. I feel we should go a step further to see whether the community can be made our partners in this process of redevelopment. Time has come when we actually go back to the communities and put them into the habit of making micro savings. They should get into the habit of savings and when we tell them that you are partners in the process, your equity participation is not only in the form of the land that you are occupying, your equity participation is also going to the small savings that you will do. You should also contribute maybe 10%, 20% or whatever is affordable to you in the whole process of redevelopment. That would make them feel also that they are partners in the process. We will also treat them as equal partners in the process. Some of the issues that I have brought out when we treat them as partners in the process that we have to actually arrange meetings of the networks that are formed. There are already in these informal settlements or also in the, the tenanted buildings that we talk about in urban renewal. There are also already social groups which are the, the Ganesh Mandals or other Bal Krida Mandal or the Women's Mandal. So they are already organized along the youth lines, along the women's lines, the business community lines. We need to tap into those strengths. Organizing survey with the community representatives. We can be thinking that we are the best surveyors because we have the degree to know as to how a survey should be done. We can be the best planners. But I feel that the people also know how, because their domain knowledge is much better than what we have. So can we, at all these stages of implementation, survey documentation, planning designing, implementation, and post-occupation, in all these four stages, can we take them along and say that they are also decision makers in this process? As I mentioned, supporting community, collecting savings, establishing joint committees to oversee implementation, where they are also there, strengthening local groups and building collective management skills for post-implementation. This is very important because the lifestyle is changing from a present type of a high-density, low-rise shanty structures. We are putting them into tall vertical buildings. How do they manage that? The education part that he talked about, we need to actually go through that right from the beginning of the process. And this whole process of redevelopment should keep them always with us. Brings me to the final slide of my presentation that we have always been talking about PPP. Can we move on to a concept of P to the power four, where people also get joined in those three Ps, and it is no longer merely public-private partnership, but it is people-public-private partnership. Thank you. Uh, this is my first time um, in India. Historically, obviously, many of you know, which I will not spend time uh, much on, is the scrapers have the power to capture the human imagination because of its scale, its symbolic nature, and to show the financial well-being and uh, the technologies and the potential for iconic representation of cities. And we recognize cities by their structures, by their high-rise buildings, going from Shanghai um, and now uh, we have um, Inchon, um, uh, Korea, and Burj Dubai, obviously, um, is, is one of the last completed projects. But if you look at all the buildings and what went on Dubai, it changed what we can do architecturally in the last four years. It's unbelievable. And if I take Burj Dawar, for example, this is a Marshall Stravel, a friend of mine, who had done some analysis on this. For example, if I take all these houses and trying to put them in a tower, the area that you need is about 2.4 um, million, uh, 20, 24, um, it's a huge amount of area that you need to fit the same amount of housing that you put in a tower. And the question is, this is 
Bush Dubai. Look at the amount of space that it created from a sustainability standpoint. It's good. Why can't we do that? Tokyo, same way. We are, you know, many of the things that we, that we do today is related to this issue. And if we look at the amount of energy, this is taken again from other uh, speakers um, borrowed um, in the past. What we see is transportation, buildings, and industry, and the industry that makes the building pretty much control the majority of what we do from a sustainable standpoint. So the most important thing is how to utilize the material effect most effectively um, um, uh, in, the, you know, in the future and, and uh, from now on. If you look at the building pyramid, in terms of what are the most important things to deal about from a sustainability standpoint, there are many. The site is the most important. The building form, such as the aspect ratio, the core, the orientation, it has a huge impact in terms of the embodied energy that we have in the building. Building envelope, building services, Whatever we do in renewable energy, it's just the small aspects of what we are trying to achieve. So let's not miss the fact that, of that. For me, as a structural engineer, one of the most important things, and this is again from the Council on Tall Building and Urban Habitat, as the building gets taller, the most important aspect in terms of sustainability and energy saving is the structure. The taller the building gets, the more material you use. Everything else is remain uniform, right? So if I got a 100 and or 200 sturdy building, the key element that I wanted to optimize is the structure. And you know, engineers historically have been um, great at doing that. Because if you look at the energy life cycle that in the embodied energy, pretty much the structure and uh, other components represent more than half of the lifetime of the building. And come Burj Dubai. Look at that structure. Can you see the similarities? The core is empty. It has nothing in it. Just like the bottom of the Eiffel Tower. And then you have the flow the load to the outside. The amount of material that you use in Porsche Dubai, it didn't exceed for the lateral system what we need for a gravity load. And that's real optimization in terms of using material like you heard previously with Bill Baker. As an engineer today, we're faced with a, good, with a lot of questions. Is it really steel that we're going to use, or is it concrete, or is it composite? What kind of structural system we need to look at? Today, as an engineers, we are, have many, many available technologies, structural materials, high-performance concrete, high-performance steel, post-tensioning, fire-resistant, casting, composites. As an engineers, we're thinking to have too many things, computer technologies. Structural system optimization, health monitoring program, it can give us everything we need. Smart systems, damping, pace isolation, smart material that changes characteristics with time. Architects are constantly changing, looking for things that are lighter, that are better, that are more efficient. And I think wound engineering, the engineers have to think about how to control the dynamics. Seismic engineering, such as performance based design and, and special detailing, extreme events. U.S. codes obviously did not address those very well, but now we are getting into those as a part of performance-based design system. Structural detailing, redundancy, and robustness. So as a structural engineer, we're designing all these buildings, have to think about all of these matter in developing the ideal structural system for the support tall building in order to get an optimum solution that works very well. And the question comes back, is it steel or is it clear concrete? With damping or without damping? Obviously, what we have with the present materials, composite is good, high-strength concrete is good, and practically you can evaluate them very clearly from the early design concept. Now we're drifting apart from the traditional method of all tall building being an office building. It become residential, it become composite. We have concrete, we have steel, and we're seeing it drift away from steel construction into more of a concrete construction. Why? High-performance concrete it has a strength, Modulus of elasticity, mass, damping, moldability, cost effectiveness because of the speed of construction that it can provide, such as a climbing form system, slip form system, connectivity, self compacting, uh, carbon fiber, high strength. We can do all of that. We can essentially, like we did in Burj Dubai, mold and extrude the building by using concrete as a single member without having to worry about the issues that you deal with with other things. 
Burj Dubai is another example of all of that research. It started out of this building. Okay? And practically, if you take, initially, uh, probably you heard, Bill, we didn't know how high that building was. So we needed to create a structure that you can expand without necessarily changing the architecture. This is Tower Palace 3, the initial concept. This is Burj Dubai. So there's a huge correlation where you can extend it from experience and apply it in the new technologies. Obviously, some of the things that we've done um, in Burj Dubai is, I, I'm going to skip over uh, just uh, uh, so many things, but what you will see here is changing the shape is very important. In its chimneys, what do we do to control the wind? Spoilers, right? Look at Burj Dubai. It's a spoiler, just exactly like you do in a chimney. And that, by itself, it controlled the wind effect on the tower, and it played a major role in, in controlling that. And now we're going into CFDs, wind dynamics, um, and, and we can get a lot of answers out of, out of these, so I'm going to skip over. But adding opening around the corner, and so on and so forth, to make the building a little bit better. The question is come down to dynamics and damping. This is always a question. Do we use damping or not? For me, today, damping is a cheap, it becoming a very, very cheap solution. And there is no reason for people not to incorporate it if they can, okay? So I think damping is very important. It's provide uh, very high dependability. It used to solve a problem. Uh, today, we are exceedingly using uh, the, the, the damping system as part of the dynamic of the building. Before we design structure in a simple way, now it's very, very complicated. So essentially, it becomes more of a building control uh, system. And these are examples of how we use viscoelastic dampers, uh, tune mass dampers, uh, dampers that have been used to control the dynamic of the building under seismic zones uh, to, to actually keep the building more or less in the elastic range. So you don't need, as designer, you don't need to do this, but a lot of time incorporating this, it makes a huge difference to the performance of the project. Obviously, so many of you probably hoping what we did for Burj Dubai, obviously, it was a very tall tower. Um, you know, we have to build it very fast, very quickly, and we had a very, very strategic approach. Three-day cycle, optimum transportation system, optimum forward, well-organized logistics and plans. What are the three-day cycle? We looked at everything under the sun in order to achieve that, whether ACS, up up method, column, uh, and so on and so forth, high strength concrete. And, and um, you know, the construction method, as you can see, the construction of the tower is just like manufacturing plant. Everything ticks, everything planned, everything worked like beautifully as anything. Um, so, because of the lack of time, obviously ACS form uh, system prefabricated um, uh, rebar and lifted up, so we don't we reduce the amount of labor that we do at the top of the tower. So, do most of the fabrication on the ground, lifted up in position, a drop head system to speed up the construction, and concrete planning work was a huge amount of work that was done in coordination with the construction. Um, with, the, with the designers uh, in order to make sure that we never miss anything. And nobody from beginning of the construction up to the end can ask any question, how am I going to cure the slab, how am I going to do this, how am I going to do that. We did all kind of testing from an early design concept. Obviously, Bill spoke about, we spend a huge amount of time related to the, what kind of mixed design we have uh, in order to optimize the pumping and make sure the characteristics of the concrete remain intact when we pump it to about 600 meters in the air. We did all kind of creep and shrinkage studies to ensure uh, that we got the behavioral characteristics of the concrete that we wanted. Full-scale testing related to the concrete, the curing, uh, what have you. Full-scale uh, pumping test um, relative to the, um, to, to ensure that the concrete uh, can be pumped up to the highest level. And these are just um, some of the pumps that, uh, that we use there. One of the things that we did is one of the biggest mega research projects uh, that ever existed in tall buildings is uh, created a very detailed monitoring program for foundation, for horizontal monitoring, vertical monitoring, um, uh, and, and give us a feedback on the behavioral characteristics of the building in real time. And now we are installing a real-time monitoring program to look at the actual dynamic characteristics of the building um, from foundation, from seismic to wind, and what have you. And these are some of the strain gauges that you, that you see today.